Continuing on with the Communist Manifesto. Bourgeois and proletarians. The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. And I've tried to demonstrate that in my historical surveys. That's one of the running themes is that is that class struggle has been with us throughout history. And, uh, and so it's important to pay attention to that aspect of history. Okay. Free man and slave, patrician and pleban, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Okay, so either in this class struggle, we periodically get revolutions where one class uh, overpowers another class or we get a total disintegration, uh, sort of like with the end of the Roman Empire. Okay. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves, stratified in that order. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs, and almost all of these classes, again, subordinate Gradation. Okay, so even within these classes, there's subordinated gradations. Okay, the modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of opposition, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Our epic, the epic of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinctive feature. It has simplified the class antagonisms. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. So there's really two major classes uh, now. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave off and I have a, a, a sort of breakdown of that, but I'll, I think I'll hold off on that until a little further down. From the serfs of the Middle Ages sprang the chartered burghers of the earliest towns, those who gathered together in towns, uh, escaped serfs or freed serfs, uh, made their way to certain locations where they set up markets. And then they struggled to get charters from the king or other lord of the land to make their town legal and have some legal status. And so this is what Marx and Engels are talking about. From these burgesses, the first elements of the bourgeoisie were developed. And I've tried to draw that out over this long period of history that they're referring to. This discovery of America, the rounding of the Cape uh, in Africa, opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie, the East Indian and Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, the increase in the means of exchange and in commodities generally, gave to commerce, to navigation, to industry, an impulse never before known, and thereby to the revolutionary element in the tottering feudal society, a rapid development. The feudal system of industry under which industrial production was monopolized by closed guilds now no longer sufficed for the growing wants of the new markets. The manufacturing system took its place. The guild masters were pushed on one side by the manufacturing middle class. Division of labor between the different corporate guilds vanished in the face of division of labor in each single wor workshop. Okay, so I've talked about division of labor. I've talked about the demise of of uh, trade guilds and this rising revolutionary class of bourgeoisie. Okay. Uh, 
Meantime, the markets kept ever growing, the, uh, the demand ever rising, even manufacture no longer sufficed. Thereupon, steam and machinery revolutionized industrial production, the industrial bourgeois revolution. The place of manufacture was taken by the giant modern industry, the place of the industrial middle class by industrial millionaires like Sir Robert Peel, right, and Prime Minister Peel. The leaders of whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeoisie. Modern industry has established the world market for which the discovery of America paved the way. This market has given an increase and an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communication by land. This development has in its time reacted on the extension of industry. And in proportion as industry, commerce, navigation, railways extended, in the same proportion, the bourgeoisie developed increased its capital and pushed into the background every class handed down from the Middle Ages. So the bourgeoisie are pushing themselves ahead of everybody else. We see therefore now or how the modern bourgeoisie is itself the product of a long course of development, a long durée history of a series of revolutions in the modes of production and of exchange. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. So we have economic development, we have political development, and they go hand in hand, uh, all redounding to the benefit of the bourgeoisie. These, this millionaire class, like Sir Robert Peel, an oppressed class under the sway of the feudal nobility, an armed and self-governing association in the medieval commune, those are the medieval cities, the early cities, here independent urban republic, as in Italy and Germany, they are taxable third estate of the monarchy, as in France. Uh, afterwards, and remember that the third estate was the commoners in France, and that's where the bourgeoisie belonged. Um, and if they had money, then they got taxed heavily but they didn't get the benefits of, of the uh, class structure of the Ancien Regime. Afterwards, in the period of manufacture proper, uh, the Industrial Revolution, serving either the semi-feudal or the absolute monarch as counterpoise against the nobility, and in fact, cornerstone of the great monarchies in general. The bourgeoisie has at last, since the establishment of modern industry, and of the world market conquered for itself in the modern representative state, uh, parliamentary monarchy or a straight uh, republic with representative uh, democracy, uh, they've, they've conquered for itself, the bourgeoisie, the exclusive political sway, the exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. And, and England is a good example of this. They still have a monarch as a figurehead uh, by this stage of the game, but it's the parliament that runs everything through the executive of the prime minister and the prime minister mo very recently before the publishing of this in, in England was uh, Prime Minister Robert Peel, uh, who comes directly out of that millionaire bourgeois class and is organizing the state for the benefit of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. Okay, so this is, this is important to notice that he's saying that the bourgeoisie are a revolutionary class, that they were a revolutionary class and that they succeeded in completing their revolution. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has piteously torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors, and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment, 
It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism in the icy water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value. And in place of the numberless and indefeasible chartered freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom free trade. In one word, for exploitation, veiled by religious and political illusions, naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. Okay, so, um, so the, the tone here may not uh, exactly uh, be clear. Uh, you gotta, you gotta really remember that that Marx and Engels and the communists are very happy about the end of the feudal order. The bourgeoisie uh, conducted a revolution against the feudal order. The feudal order was very bad in the view of the communists. Uh, the uh, so the bourgeoisie are to be credited with that, but what they put in place is something just as exploitative. They just speak in the language of freedom, but ultimately it's not the freedom of, uh, that the common people want, that the proletariat wants. It's the freedom of trade. It's free trade, which is the freedom of millionaires at this stage of the game to uh, freely exploit every market around the world and to exploit all the workers of the entire globe. That's the freedom that the bourgeoisie are really instituting. They speak the language of freedom of the press, of freedom to vote, of the uh, uh, freedom of speech, of the freedom of religion. But ultimately, what they're actually instituting more than anything else is the freedom of millionaire capitalists to exploit ever more thoroughly, not only within individual nations, but internationally. Brutal exploitation. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil and has reduced the family relation to a mere money relation. Okay, so uh, here we have an argument saying that the bourgeoisie have destroyed the family. Uh, as we'll see later on, yes, uh, communists are, at, are often criticized, even at this time, of trying to destroy the family. But who has more successfully destroyed family relations than the bourgeoisie, where, uh, where we used to have in European society, extended families living in relative proximity and uh, a whole network of aunts and uncles and, and um, going out you know, to second and third cousins and everything like that. And there was a sense of uh, fam family coherence. The family has been reduced to a nuclear family and it's largely based on economic relations uh, you know, of getting ahead in this uh, ultra competitive environment of the free market. Um, okay, so the bourgeoisie has disclosed how it came to pass that the brutal display of vigor in the Middle Ages, which reactionists so much admire, uh, reactionists are those who are reacting against liberalism. So the conservatives are reactionists and want to go back to some kind of feudalism, um, you know, which is you, you can't go backwards in history. Uh, but that doesn't stop people from at least rhetorically uh, su suggesting such things. 
Um, the bourgeoisie has disclosed how it came to pass that the brutal display of vigor in the Middle Ages, which reactionists so much admire, found its fitting complement in the most slothful indolence. It has been the first to show what man's activity can bring about. It has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former exoduses of nations and crusades. Uh, so uh, bourgeois industrial capitalism has done some great wonders as well. This is not entirely negative. Uh, the the negative tone comes in the analysis that this is all built not by the bourgeoisie who benefit and enjoy the the great wealth but it was all built by the labor of the proletariat it's, it's working people that really built these things uh, and the bourgeoisie have appropriated the labor of the proletariat. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. And of course, the factory system, uh, you know, really uh, undermine social relationships and especially the family. You know, you have family separations, you have children working in factories, you have adults who can no longer work and are just uh, unemployed because they're, they're uh, permanent, permanently disabled, uh, a total destruction of any social cohesion that, that existed uh, at the beginning of the 18th century. Conservation of the old modes of production in unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence for all earlier industrial classes. Uh, conservation of the old modes of production, right? The, the, the burger, the, the master craftsman doing a burger style uh, uh, production process was trying to maintain a tradition not always trying to revolutionize and change things up, but the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, they're always innovating and they're just keep on changing things constantly. And those changes in the production process lead to changes in society so that society is thrown into chaos. Uh, constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguished the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed, fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new foreign ones became, become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profane. And man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. So the bourgeoisie is always in motion, always moving from country to country and revolutionizing country after country in exploitative ways. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie, I said this, all over the world. The bourgeoisie has through its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country, to the great chagrin of reactionists, it is drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. And of course, we see this most clearly in the late 20th century with the offshoring of manufacturing jobs. Factories are no longer uh, being built in the United States, they're all being built in China, right? In other places, and in Mexico, for example. Um, and so uh, any sort of national 
dominance and and predominance is 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 swiped out right from under the feet of the conservatives who are nationalistic because the bourgeoisie don't care. They're international. They're cosmopolitan. They're moving on to the next market. They're moving on to the next labor pool. Uh, they're mobile and they're global. And all old established national industries have been destroyed or daily being destroyed. They're dislodged by new industries who inter whose introduction becomes a life and a death question for all civilized nations by industries that no longer work up indigenous raw materials, but raw material drawn from the remotest zones. Industries whose products are consumed not only at home, but in every quarter of the globe. In place of the old ones satisfied by the product productions of the country, we find new ones requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, universal inter interdependence of nations, and as in materials, so also in intellectual production. The intellectual creations of individual nations become common property, like Hollywood, for example. Hollywood movies are played all around the world. That's a cultural production of the United States, and you know, in Hollywood, you know, uh, largely one city, and yet uh, this is this is just becomes the common cultural currency of everybody around the world. National one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become more and more impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures, there arises a world literature. Okay, so now this is interesting to see this globalization of intellectual products. Um, we see that with Hollywood is a very good example of that. Uh, and before it was Hollywood, it was Berlin, it was in Germany. Um, but that shifted uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and then, and then was permanently altered after World War Two. Um, Um, but it is, now this is interesting for our purposes when we think about Dussel, and as you will see as you read Dussel, he's thinking of situating the philosophy of liberation from the periphery uh, of the core North Western American center. Uh, so he conceives of Europe and North America, and especially the United States, as the center of culture because it's the center of the industrial bourgeois culture. And then he wants to situate the philosophy of liberation as a periphery phenomenon, uh, in his case, coming out of Mexico because uh, that's where he lived and, and has worked most of his life, most of his professional life. And so, uh, and so he's really now, this is one place where he starkly disagrees with Marx and Engels here, because he doesn't see the bourgeois revolution as actually developing a what he would think of as an authentic world literature or world philosophy. Uh, he sees it as all very Euro North centric and that those who come at things from a different perspective are sidelined by the dominant literary philosophical conversation. Um, and I will, you know, try to uh, explain uh, what he means by that. And I think he has a good point. Um, but, uh, but let's be let's be thinking about that because because Marx and Engels are very 
optimistic about the potential of globalized, internationalized society of the bourgeoisie, because this is part of what makes the revolution possible and makes a social, uh, socialist global world order possible. Okay. The bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. The cheap prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls, with which it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. It compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst. In other words, to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. Uh, and, and this now is the aspect of this uh, vision of globalization that uh, Dussel would agree with that to the extent there is a, a world literature and a world philosophy, um, the bourgeoisie force conformity to the bourgeois notion of philosophy, which is like this modern philosophy that, uh, that Dussel will criticize heavily, uh, and which I've given a historical survey of. The bourgeoisie has subjected the country to the rule of the towns. It has created enormous cities, has greatly increased the urban population as compared with the rule. It has thus rescued a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life, just as it has made the country dependent on the towns. So it has made barbarian and semi-barbarian countries dependent on the civilized ones, nations of peasants on nations of bourgeois, the east on the west. Okay, so, um, and here, this is very much in line with uh, Dussel because Dussel originally in the early 19th century or in the early 1960s was very focused on uh, the concept of development as discussed in Che Guevara. We saw that in the meetings and um, also, um, uh, Gutierrez talked about development and gave a good, nice little summary of that. Um, that's where Dussel started to think politically was regarding the issue of development in Latin America. And then part of that discussion became what was called dependency theory and describing the way in which Latin American countries by and large are, were forced to be dependent upon the US uh, capitalist uh, market and, and forced to really, as a nation, a, a country like Mexico or El Salvador or Guatemala or uh, Brazil is forced to serve the interests of transnational corporations based uh, on Wall Street. And so you have entire nations that are dependent upon uh, the bourgeois form of production. And of course, uh, Guatemala is a very good example with the National Fruit Company. And um, I don't know if I gave you that passage, but there is a passage where Che Guevara uh, talks about experiencing the National Fruit company in Guatemala for, for the first time. Uh, and it's uh, quite a uh, poetic description uh, of the problem uh, going on in the, uh, this would be in the 1950s when he was younger and traveling around Latin America. Um, okay, so dependency, very much part of what Dussel is thinking about in the background. But in the work that we're reading, he doesn't go into dependency theory too much. It, that's just kind of assumed as background, you know, because 
from the 1970s forward, Dussel became much more interested in this philosophy of liberation, which goes in a, a bit of a different direction. And instead of just analyzing the problem, dussel has been trying to develop a way of getting around the problem. And so his, his work is really perspective and, and, and prescriptive and saying, hey, we should approach philosophy and political economy uh, from an entirely different direction, namely from the periphery, which has, you know, is, is engaged with the core of the United States, is, is engaged, especially through this, these dependency relationships, but has resources that are outside of the bourgeois uh, conception of philosophy and therefore refound philosophy on a new, new basis. Okay. So the bourgeoisie keeps more and more doing away with the scattered state of the population, of the means of production and of property. It is agglomerated production and is concentrated property in a few hands. The necessary consequence of this was political centralization. Now, this is very important. I've, I've tried to emphasize this uh, wherever it came up uh, in the discussions of the historical material. Bourgeois production and bourgeois uh, political economy is highly centralized. One of the big complaints about, for example, the Soviet Union uh, that uh, bourgeois uh, liberals would make against the Soviet Union was its highly centralized uh, management of the production processes and natural resources and, and all these sorts of things. And even and we've seen this more recently, which some of us might remember, but uh, maybe is only kind of vague in our minds. But there was Obamacare when Obama was president, and one of the big complaints from the reactionary conservatives in the Senate, especially, was that it was uh, uh, doomed to fail because it's overly centralized character that is it was producing a national health care system and a national health care system is obviously flawed because it's overly centralized. But what do transnational corporations do? They centralize, centralize, centralize. And even if there's two different um, competitors, uh, Chevy and Ford, it used to be uh, in the US uh, market, or if it's Coke and Pepsi, um, even the degree to which they compete is, is really just uh, a, sort of, a sort of gamesmanship, kabuki theater, if that makes sense uh, to you, or just sort of playing a charade of competition when really it's just one grand monopoly and um, a totally centralized corporate uh, head based in Wall Street serving the interest of Wall Street. And, uh, and this goes across industries. Um, so uh, bourgeois production and political economy is highly, highly, highly centralized. Uh, yet they pretend as if it's not. Uh, yeah, just one of those things. Um, And so really when the bourgeois liberals or conservatives complain about centralization, what they mean is they don't want the government to be involved. They want highly centralized authoritarian structures, namely transnational corporations, which are entirely undemocratic. Um, and, and that's something to remember here is that the transnational corporation is undemocratic, is authoritarian, and it's highly centralized. All the things that the bourgeois liberals and conservatives are supposed to be against is, is exactly the opposite. When is the last time at your job, if you have to work, uh, if you're not super rich, um, when is the last time at your job that you got to vote on when you were going to make uh, your product or service, uh, where you were going to uh, produce your product or service, uh, how, how much of the proceeds were going to go to the executives versus going to the workers actually producing the product. 
et cetera, et cetera. How many of those decisions have you been involved in? Uh, by and large, most workers are never involved in these. It's not a democracy. It's, they don't want your input uh, because it's an authoritarian structure. Okay. Um, the necessary consequence of all this was political centralization. Independent or closely connected provinces with separate interests, laws, governments, and systems of taxation became lumped together into one nation. Okay, this is the modern nation state, which then grows larger and larger into empires with one government, one code of laws, one national class interest, one frontier, and one customs tariff. The bourgeoisie during its rule of scare, uh, scarce 100 years has created more massive and more colossal pro productive forces than have all, all preceding generations together, okay, the Industrial Revolution. Subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railway, electric, telegraphs, clearing of whole continents for cultivation, canalization, making of canals, of rivers, whole populations conjured out of the ground. What earlier century had even a presentiment that such a productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor and that social labor is when people are organized in a division of labor and combining their labor force together. We see then the means of production and of, of exchange on whose foundation the bourgeoisie built itself up were generated in feudal society. So the roots are in feudal society. At a certain stage in the development of these means of production and of exchange, the conditions under which feudal society produced and exchanged the feudal organization of agriculture and manufacturing industry, burger production. In one word, the feudal relations of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces, like we saw with the textile industry. Cottage industry just was wiped out. They became so many fetters. They had to be burst asunder. They were burst asunder. Into their place stepped free competition, accompanied by a social and political constitution adapted to it, and by the economical and political sway of the bourgeois class. A similar movement is going on before our own eyes. Modern bourgeois society with its relations of production, of exchange, and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. So this is an interesting imagery. Uh, Marx is very fond of, of these uh, poetic uh, metaphors. So he sees the bourgeoisie as a kind of sorcerer who has called up demons that he can no longer control. Uh, and, and namely the proletariat, as we will see. For many, a, a decade past the history of industry and commerce is but the history of the revolt of modern productive forces against modern conditions of produ production, against the property relations that are the conditions for the existence of the bourgeoisie and of its rule, the conditions for the existence. That's a very Kantian uh, way of talking. Kant, you know, described the categories of thought as the conditions for the existence of the phenomena that we see. Uh, so that's a very uh, Kantian turn of phrase, and we see the influence of Kant on Marx and Engels. It is enough to mention the commercial crises that by their per periodical return put on its trial, each time more threateningly, the existence of the entire bourgeois society is threatened. And this, is, this has been true since capitalism got off the ground. Uh, sometime in the mid 18th century, um, you know, if you just track um, in the United States, but this generally was a worldwide phenomenon, Whenever the U United States has a recession, that recession is reflected uh, all over the world to some extent or another. And uh, we have a recession, we have a downturn, a crisis in, in capitalism every four to seven years. Every four to seven years, there's an economic crisis 
in capitalism. And it happens over and over again. And every time they act like it's so surprising. But it happens every four to seven years. Just one after another after another. And this is just built into capitalism. And that's largely what, why Marx wrote Capital was to describe how and why these crises happen every four to seven years. Uh, so it is enough to mention the commercial crises that by their periodical return put on its trail each time more threateningly the existence of the entire bourgeois society. In these crises, a great part not only of the existing products, but also of the previously created productive forces are periodically destroyed. Right? The economy is destroyed. In these crises, there breaks out an epidemic that in all earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity, the epidemic of overproduction. So that's one interesting thing that Marx and Engels uh, draw out in capital is that the crises of capital are generally crises of producing too much stuff and not being able to sell it. And then having it just be uh, evaporated to be wiped out as a loss uh, every four to seven years. Society suddenly finds itself put back into a state of a momentary barbarism. It appears as if a famine, a universal war of devastation had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seem to be destroyed. And why? Because there's too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. And, uh, you know, uh, this is this is like where we have children going to, to bed this evening, uh, hungry, where throughout the entire United States, we're producing more food than we can actually eat. We're destroying food, we're throwing it away. Farmers are paid to dump milk down the drain, but there are children going to bed hungry. It, it's a crisis in which there's too much. And so that's why the poor have too little, because there's too much. Uh, and this is, you know, the central contradiction that Marx and Engels see in capitalism. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer tend to further the development of the conditions of bourgeois property. On the contrary, they have become too powerful for these conditions by which they are fettered. And so soon as they overcome these fetters, they bring disorder into the whole bourgeois society, endanger the existence of bourgeois property when people have their fortunes wiped out. The conditions of bourgeois society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises. The crises get more destructive every round. And, and we've seen this in recent decades where the financial crises are just ever larger. And now we're heading towards the ecological cataclysm brought on by this increasing waves of capitalist crisis. And this all diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. And we see that with the ecological cataclysm uh, very clearly, that uh, because the economy has to keep rolling, um, it's just impossible to cut CO2 emissions. It's impossible. But we could do it physically. It's not physically impossible. It's just impossible because we don't want to do it because we want to make more money. And we have to make more money because if we don't make more money next year than we made this year, then there's a crisis. You don't want a crisis. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a kind of a blackmail situation. The weapons with which the bourgeoisie 
felled feudalism to the ground are now turned against the bourgeoisie itself. But not only has the bourgeoisie forged weapons that bring death to itself, it has also called into existence the men who are to wield those weapons, the modern working class, the proletarians. Okay, so these are the demons that the Corsair has called up. Um, and Marx and Engels think that uh, the downfall of the bourgeoisie is imminent in 1848. Okay, um, so here we see a big problem with their whole uh, conception. Uh, we're in 2021 and most people would say that the bourgeoisie industrial capitalists are still on top. To some extent that's true. To some extent it's kind of like we're not even in capitalism anymore. So, um, <clears throat> but the socialist revolution has not come. Okay. In proportion as the bourgeoisie, in other words, capital is developed in the same proportion as the proletariat. As the bourgeoisie gets more developed, the proletariat gets more developed. The modern working class, they get developed, a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work and who find work only so long as their labor increases capital. These laborers who must sell themselves piecemeal are a commodity like every other article of commerce and are consequently exposed to all the vicissitudes of competition, to all the fluctuations in the market. We know that uh, it, those of us who have to work, um, that is a very precarious marketplace for your labor. You can get fired at any time. There could be an economic downturn. There's layoffs. You get hired back at a lower wage, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you don't know, is it, is it gonna last? Is it gonna, is it gonna blow up on our face? Have another financial meltdown? Uh, when is it gonna happen? Well, it's gonna happen every four to seven years. Um, but it creates a lot of crisis and turmoil in people's lives. And of course the proletariat, the laborers do not have any control. The bourgeoisie, the owners of the means of production have all of the control and the workers have none of the control. Owing to the extensive use of machinery and to division of labor, the work of the proletarians has lost all individual character and consequently all charm for the workmen. You're no longer a craftsman, you're just a cog in a machine. He becomes an appendage of the machine. And it is only the most simple, most monotonous, the most easily acquired knack that is required of this laborer. Hence, the cost of production of a workman is restricted almost entirely to the means of subsistence that he requires for his maintenance and for the propagation of his race. You only pay the worker what will keep him alive and keep him producing kids so that you have more, so you have a viable workforce uh, going forward. But the price of a commodity and, their, a commodity and therefore also of labor is equal to its cost of production. In proportion, therefore, as the repulsiveness of the work increases, the wage decreases. Uh, nay, more, in proportion as the use of machinery and division of labor increases, in the same proportion, the burden of toil also increases. The jobs become more burdensome, whether by prolongation of working hours. So we saw that fight uh, with Owen and uh, other liberals trying to, and also the working class itself, trying to bring down the number of, of hours for children and then women, but men were still, at the end of our story, still working 18 hour days. Um, and, and even maybe burdened with longer and more intensive work because the women and children weren't there in the factory. Um, so the burden of toil also increases as capital increases, whether by prolongation, lengthening of the work hours, by increase of the work exacted in a given time, or by increased speed of the machinery, et cetera, et cetera. Modern industry has converted the little workshop of the patriarchal master craftsman into the great factory of the industrial capitalist, like Arkwright and his factory system. And Sir Robert Peel and all of his cotton mills. Masses of laborers crowded into the factory are organized like soldiers, 
as privates of the industrial army, army, they are placed under the command of a perfect hierarchy of our officers and sergeants. And notice that in the factory system, there is a strict hierarchy. It is an authoritarian hierarchy, not democratic, not free for the worker, free for the capitalists to exploit as they see fit. Not only are they slaves of the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overlooker, and above all, by the individual bourgeois manufacturer himself, the owner of the factory. The more openly this despotism proclaims gain to be its end and aim, the more petty, the more hateful, the more embittering it is, this factory system of what communists come to call wage slavery. The less the skill and exertion of strength implied in manual labor, in other words, the more modern industry becomes developed, the more is the labor of men superseded by that of women. Differences of age and sex, children, you know, now can be on the same par as a man. These differences of age and sex no longer uh, any distinctive have no longer have any social, uh, no longer have any distinctive social validity for the working class. Again, this goes to the destruction of traditional family structures. All are instruments of labor, more or less expensive to use according to their age or sex. Uh, it might be cheaper to hire children. It might be cheaper to hire women. And if they can do the same job, why not? No sooner is the exploitation of the laborer by manufacturing so far at an end that he receives his wages in cash than he is set upon the other portions of the bourgeoisie, the landlord, uh, set upon by the other portions of the bourgeoisie, the landlord, the shopkeeper, the pawnbroker, etc. Um, and so the, the laborer is getting it, uh, getting exploited throughout his entire existence in bourgeois society. The lower strata, strata of the middle class, the small tradespeople, shopkeepers, retired tradesmen generally, the handicraftsmen and peasants, uh, all these sink gradually into the proletariat, uh, partly because their diminutive capital does not suffice for the scale on which modern industry is carried on and is swamped in the competition with the large capitalists, partly because their specialized skill is rendered worthless by the new methods of production. We don't need skilled workers. Thus, the proletariat is recruited from all classes of the population. The proletariat goes through various stages of development with its birth begins its struggle with the bourgeoisie, at first, the contest is carried on by individual laborers, then by the work people of the factory, then by the operatives of one trade in one locality against the individual bourgeois who directly exploits them. They direct their attacks not against the bourgeois conditions of production, but against the instruments of production themselves, like the Luddites machine smashing and, and the, um, the swing riots uh, breaking up the the threshing machines in the countryside. Uh, they, they attack the machines instead of the, the whole exploitative system of production. They set factories ablaze. They seek to restore by force the vanishing status of the workmen of the Middle Ages. And they're trying to go backwards in history. And we're not going backwards in history. That's, that's one thing that Marxists are, are very clear about and Marx and Engels believe that we're on a progr progression. You know, this is somewhat rooted in uh, Feuerbach, but ultimately rooted in Hegel, right? That believe that history was unfolding in a progressive way towards greater freedom. Um, uh, communists and Marx and Engels here see that history is on a tra trajectory of progress and that things are gonna get better, namely, they're gonna get better and that things are gonna be more free, less authoritarian by the socialist revolution. But we're not gonna to return to the conditions of the Middle Ages. We're not gonna to return to feudalism. 
That's not what we're talking about. At this stage, the laborers still form an incoherent mass when they are thinking about returning to the Middle Ages and smashing machinery and whatnot. Um, an incoherent mass, they are scattered over the whole country and broken up by their mutual competition. They're competing against each other instead of against the bourgeoisie. If anywhere they unite to form more compact bodies, this is not yet the consequence of their own active union, but of the union of the bourgeoisie, which class in order to attain its own political ends is compelled to set the whole proletariat in motion and is moreover yet for a time able to do so. Uh, and so the bourgeoisie mobilized the proletariat for you know, particular liberal causes like the 10 hour workout, uh, 10 hour workday for children or mobilize the proletariat to go to war with another nation. But the more that you mobilize the proletariat on a grand scale, the more it becomes conscious of itself. Okay, so that's what we're gonna see here. Uh, at this stage, therefore, the proletarians do not fight their enemies, but the enemies of their enemies, the remnants of absolute monarchy, the landowners, the non-industrial bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, thus, the whole historical movement is concentrated in the hands of the bourgeoisie. Every victory so obtained is a victory for the bourgeoisie. Uh, uh, yes, if, if, uh, if, uh, you know, the Luddites are, are smashing the machines of small manufacturers, you know, spinning jennies and, and whatnot, that, whatnot like that. Uh, that's not hurting the industrial capitalist. And even when the industrial capitalist has machine breaking taking place in their factory, they have the, the millions of dollars to replace that. And so it's not nearly as destructive to the bourgeoisie as it is to the, the petty bourgeoisie, the small uh, business owner who may find themselves a target in this. And the bourgeoisie, the industrial bourgeoisie may purposely direct the anger of the masses to these secondary uh, people who are not the real enemy of the proletariat. That's where it can become very destructive. But with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses its strength grows, it feeds that strength more. The various interests and conditions of life within the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized as they're all becoming wage slaves and all replaceable and interchangeable. In proportion as machinery obliterates all distinctions of labor and nearly everywhere reduces wages to the same low level. The growing competition among the bourgeois and the resulting commercial crises make the wages of the workers ever more fluctuating. The unceasing improvement of machinery ever more rapidly developing makes their livelihood more and more precarious. The collisions between individual workmen and individual bourgeois take more and more the character of collisions between two classes. Thereupon the workers begin to form combine, uh, combinations, that is trade unions against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the rate of wages. They found permanent associations in order to make provision for beforehand for these occasional revolts. Uh, they're getting organized, getting preparing ahead, doing the upfront uh, labor to produce the means for the revolution. Uh, here and there, the contest breaks out into riots. Now and then the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real fruit of their battles lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever expanding union of the workers. This union is helped on by the improved means of communication that are created by modern industry itself and that, that place the workers of different localities in contact with one another. Better communication is good for the bourgeoisie owners, it's also good for the proletariat workers because they can communicate and organize better. It was just this contact that was needed to centralize the numerous local struggles, all of the same character into one national struggle between classes. But every class struggle is a political struggle and that union to attain which the burghers of the middle ages with their miserable highways required centuries, the modern proletarians thanks to railways achieve in a few years. 
So you can organize from town to town because you don't have to drive, you don't have to ride your wagon down old dirt roads like in the Middle Ages. Um, you can get on a train and be in the next city and organize there and, and create networks and, and um, unions uh, with people at, at far distances now. <clears throat> and this is, you know, again, what Marx and Engels by, mean by saying the sorcerer has, has called up the, the demons of its own destruction. Greater communication, greater mobility, all these things are good for business, but they're also good for labor and labor organization. This organization of the proletarians into a class and consequently into a political party is continually being upset again by the competition between the workers themselves in fighting. But it ever rises up again, stronger, firmer, mightier. It compels legislative recognition of particular interests of workers, a 10 hour workday, by taking advantage of the divisions among the bourgeoisie itself. Thus, the 10 hours bill in England was carried. Okay, so specifically mentioning that. Um, altogether, collisions between the classes of the old society further, in many ways, the course of development of the proletariat. The more clashing there is, the more class struggle there is, the more the proletariat grows in strength. The bourgeoisie finds itself involved in a constant battle, at first with the aristocracy, the nobility, the landed gentry, etc. Later on with those portions of the bourgeoisie itself, uh, whose interests have become antagonistic to the progress of industry, small manufacturers, uh, liberal socialists like Owens, uh, who you know, defect from the industrial bourgeois class, at all times with the bourgeoisie of foreign countries. Uh, the bourgeoisie are always fighting the bourgeoisie in another country, uh, trying to get some trade advantage over the, the English are trying to get some trade advantage over the French and the French trying to get some trade advantage over the Italians, etc. cetera. Um, in all these battles, it seems itself compelled to appeal to the proletariat to ask for its help and thus to drag it into the political arena. Uh, the bourgeoisie itself, therefore, supplies the proletariat with its own instruments of political and general education. In other words, it furnishes the proletariat with the weapons for fighting the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie provides the weapons to the proletariat that the proletariat is going to use to get rid of the bourgeoisie. Okay, this is very optimistic. They're, they're thinking that the revolution is imminent. Further, as we've already seen, entire sections of the ruling classes are, by the advance of industry, precipitated into the proletariat or, or, at, or are at least threatened in their conditions of existence. So the bourgeoisie, they, you know, uh, through competition are getting forced down into the middle class and then falling out of the middle class into the proletariat themselves. The creative destruction of bourgeoisie industrialization uh, threatens members of the bourgeoisie itself. These also supply the proletariat with fresh elements of enlightenment and progress. Now you have industrialists, and Owen is a good example. You know, he, he did some experiments, he spent all his dough, uh, he made enemies with his business partners, so he, he divests himself of his, of his uh, factory and Lenark, and um, and, and then ends up being a, uh, a propagandist for socialism. Uh, you have a bourgeois industrialist who has become the enemy of bourgeois industrialists as a class. Uh, finally, in times when the class struggle nears the decisive hour, the process of dissolution going on within the ruling class, and in fact, within the whole range of society, assumes such a violent glaring character that a small section of the ruling class cuts itself adrift and joins the revolutionary class. These are defectors. Uh, this is really like Owen, the class that holds the future in its hand. And of course, I should mention that Engels, uh, Friedrich Engels, uh, Marx's uh, partner in crime here, uh, is 
an industrial bourgeois capitalist. In fact, he's a textile manufacturer. He owns textile factories, uh, Engels does. Uh, he inherited from his father, uh, but he has defected and has become uh, the most, really, because Marx dies and Engels lives for many years afterwards. Engels is a huge uh, propagandist for, for communism uh, against bourgeois capital. He's, one, he's exactly one of these defectors that they're talking about. Because they see that the proletariat has history on its side, that that's where the progress of history is, is going, is to the, the self-consciousness of the proletariat and the socialist revolution. Just as, therefore, at, at an earlier period, a section of the nobility went over to the bourgeoisie, so now a portion of the bourgeoisie goes over to the proletariat, and in particular, a portion of the bourgeois ideologists who have raised themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole. And so, you know, Engels is very much that, and Marx, to some extent, more middle class, but. Um, but they used bourgeois education in order to then launch this attack against the bourgeoisie. Of all the classes that stand face to face with the bourgeoisie today, the proletariat alone is a really revolutionary class. Okay, so this is a big thesis of the Communist Manifesto and something that's maintained by Marxists uh, even to this day, and this is something that Dussel wants to argue against. Uh, uh, Dussel is going to argue that it is not the proletariat that is the re revolutionary class. The revolutionary class is what he calls uh, the people, the Puebla. Uh, and he likes to use uh, that Spanish term of Puebla uh, to distinguish it from maybe like we the people of the United States or something like that. He wants to be more specific and talk about the Puebla very similarly to the way that Gutierrez and Romero talk about the poor. And so Dussel sees the Puebla uh, as the revolutionary class. And so this is a real big uh, point of contention between Marxism and Dussel. So this could be a good paper topic is to think, uh, is to write about whether the proletariat is the real revolutionary class or whether Dussel's Puebla is the real revolutionary class. Um, do you agree with Dussel to some degree, but you think maybe his definition of the Puebla is not, is not exactly right? You know, so you could just explore all of this. Um, and, and of course, you know, we want to think if we, don't, if we don't have some particular ax to grind in terms of liberation, um, you can always think in terms of the ecological cataclysm. And what we've seen in recent years is people like Greta Thunberg, uh, Greta, Greta Thunberg uh, from Sweden. And, uh, you know, she's a teenager who's made a big impact on at least around the rhetoric of the, the ecological cataclysm. Um, and she's not proletarian. Um, uh, but is she Puebla, like in the way that Dussel is talking? Maybe, maybe not. Is she really on the periphery? Um, you know, it depends on on, on how you kind of analyze that. And, and you know, you could you could talk about uh, Greta Thunberg in particular. And you know, is she the the Puebla that Dussel is looking for? Does she not really qualify because she's too Euro? Um, but but she is a woman and she is a girl, like especially a few years ago. Now she's 18 or 19, but um, a few years ago, she was still a kid. And she's also uh, autistic, uh, you know, so um, there are some ways in which she is on the periphery. Uh, so, you know, she's a, a problematic person that you could, you could write about in this regard. Uh, <clears throat> But um, you know, do you think that the proletariat is still a revolutionary class? And again, how many of us uh, nowadays work in factories? 
You know, the, the whole communist manifesto here is really envisioning a world in which labor is largely conducted in factory systems. Uh, with the decline of the factory system in the United States, now this seems less relevant. But it's not as if we're not using factory labor because it's just all the factories are located in Mexico or located in China or elsewhere. But these are, for the United States, these are two major uh, sources of factory labor. Um, the industrial capitalists are just building factories in China, building factories in Mexico, directly or indirectly, through other capitalists in these countries. Um, and, and, you know, uh, one way of arguing against Dussel might to be to focus on China. China has, you know, the largest factory system that has ever existed in the history of the universe. Uh, so it's not as if factory labor has gone away. It's just relocated to China. And now you have a huge proletariat. Uh, within China. Is the proletariat in China a revolutionary force? Uh, I'm sure that the Chinese uh, Communist Party, right, with uh, Xi Jinping uh, as, its, as its head, is very concerned <laughs> about the proletariat becoming revolutionary. And so they do a lot through their authoritarian uh, surveillance and repression to make sure that it doesn't become a revolutionary force against themselves. Uh, and and how do they put a how do they put a lid on that? They they do it through repression, but also we see in China nowadays is also an increasing standard of living. People in China have undergone an increase in the standard of living way beyond anything that anybody's seen in the last 40 years in the United States. So that their standard of living is becoming more and more comparable to people living in the United States. It's still not uh, very close, but it's catching up very rapidly. Uh, and that alleviates a lot of revolutionary pressure. And also, uh, in many ways, the Chinese government is becoming less repressive and more liberal in that classical liberal sort of way, becoming more democratic and more uh, interested in the day-to-day -day welfare of the citizens and things like that. Um, and even uh, Xi, President Xi, has said that uh, by 2050, the Chinese Communist Party and the, and the Chinese people will have accomplished the socialist revolution. Uh, what he means by that, uh, I don't know, but that would be is is interesting to see and one and one you know one thing that is definitely taking place that's quite extraordinary in china is the one belt uh, one road initiative uh, that started in the early 2000s where they're just building tons and tons of infrastructure uh, they have hundreds and hundreds of high speed railways uh, where the united states uh, we really have nothing that could be considered a high-speed railway um, in comparison to the slowest you know high-speed railways in china uh, and and they're looking to connect uh, beijing to london uh, they're very close to connecting beijing to berlin and um, through like high-speed railway and and then that's also high-speed freight and uh, and just you know spreading Chinese culture across the whole Eurasian landmass, um, and this is industrial. This is industrial scale production. Uh, uh, in the last few years, let's say like in the last five years, China has used more concrete than the United States has used in its entire existence. So uh, industrialization is not over. It just has moved to China. So maybe this model of the revolutionary class of the proletariat still applies there. That might be something for you to investigate um, if that's something that interests you. 
Okay, so the other classes decay and finally disappear in the face of modern industry. The proletariat is special and essential uh, product. Uh, the bourgeoisie cannot do without the proletariat. They need factory workers. The lower middle classes, the small manufacturer, the shopkeeper, the artisan, the, the peasant, all these fight against the bourgeoisie to save from extinction their existence as fractions of the middle class. They are therefore not revolutionary, but conservative. Okay, so these petit bourgeoisie, small business people, um, small manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. They're very conservative. They just want to conserve what they already have. They're not revolutionary looking to change things. Nay, more, they are reactionary, for they try to roll back the wheel of history. So that's what reactionary means, those who want to roll back the wheel of history. And of course, communists, the, the history is progressing, it's moving on. Uh, to bigger and better things. If by chance they are revolutionary, these middle class players, they are so only in view of their impending transfer into the proletariat. As they become more conscious that they're actually falling into the proletariat, then maybe they become revolutionary. They thus defend not their present, but their future interest. They desert their own standpoint to place themselves at that of the proletariat. All right. Uh, so they see that uh, they, they think that the revolution is coming, the revolution is coming, and it's going to improve the existence of the proletariat. That's what the revolution is all about. And there's going to be those who get on board with that and those who fight against it uh, for their own uh, conservative, reactionary, or bourgeois sort of uh, values. Uh, and, and here, liberal corresponds with bourgeois very nicely. The dangerous class, the social scum, that passively rotting mass thrown off by the lowest layers of old society may here and there be swept into the movement by a proletarian revolution. It conditions of life, however, prepare it far more for the part of the bribed tool of reactionary intrigue. Here, uh, Marx and Engels are talking about what comes to be called the lumpen proletariat. Um, you know, criminals, uh, regularly unemployed people with some nationalistic uh, spirit, uh, uh, demobilized soldiers, things like that. And, and we have seen that these often become the tool of reactionary forces, even like the January 6th insurrection in the United States, um, just this past January, a lot of those people uh, that were there on that day could be considered part of this lumpen proletariat, the you know, white supremacists who have this reactionary affinity for, for the white supremacy uh, a, a, of, of yesteryear, for the, the old South and, and all these sorts of things um, because of their I, because their identity is not as workers and because they don't identify as workers against the bourgeoisie, they can be, they can be used by reactionary forces like President Trump, who is not really bourgeois, uh, who's more reactionary, um, looking you know, to restore a kind of feudal, hierarchy in society in which he of course would come out on top because he's obviously the smartest guy in the room um, it, but then he can mobilize he can manipulate white supremacists who are not doing well financially are becoming more and more unemployed or precariously employed but they don't see that as a condition of the working class they see that as a condition um, based on their whiteness uh, and that they don't get the jobs that they deserve because of all these other races and everything crowding them out. They have a totally uh, confused analysis of things. Um, 
you know, and something along those regards, thinking about reaction, reactionaryism in the United States, uh, populism, as we like to call it with uh, Trump, Trump's populism um, is something you could certainly talk about in relationship. Here we see it in the Communist Manifesto and Dussel also talks about this stuff. Uh, he has the five theses on populism in which he compares and contrasts uh, reactionary populism with uh, revolutionary left wing populism, which is more of an issue like, and as he describes it in that, in that essay, uh, when populism is discussed in Latin America, more often it is a pejorative term against leftist, against socialist, who have a large base of popular support. Like Evo Morales is one that Dussel really is enamored with because of the great successes he was making up until uh, very recently. Um, but uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is, you know, the real big uh, sort of icon of this kind of populism that he discusses there. Um, and that, that sort of gets at this issue of the Puebla. Uh, because when Hugo Chavez or Evo Morales, and especially Evo Morales, and I think this is one of the things that really changes Dussel's mind, Evo Morales, his political support, uh, a large chunk of his political support was from the indigenous population who were more peasants and countryside people rather than industrial workers in the city and uh, that was his, the base of his political support in order to be able to push through social changes, socialistic uh, governmental uh, policies, uh, because he had that, that popular support from the Puebla, which now is not the proletariat, uh, but some other uh, combination of, of interests within the broad society. Um, okay, so this is. You know, we're getting into Dussel's uh, thinking here uh, through the Communist Manifesto. So, so uh, that's why this is, is important. Let's always keep in focus that we're thinking about Dussel and we're trying to understand Dussel. Communist Manifesto here is very important for doing that. Um, okay, but there is this lump in proletariat can be mobilized by reactionary forces. And that's very prevalent in, in Latin America. And there's some things to be said there too, if you're particularly interested in that, uh, the Jakarta method kind of gets at that. In the conditions of the proletariat, those of old society at large are already virtually swapped to the proletarian is without property. His relation to his wife and children has no longer anything in common with the bourgeois family relations modern industrial labor, modern subjection to capital, the same in England as in France, in America as in Germany, has stripped him of every trace of national character. Law, morality, religion are to him so many bourgeois prejudices, behind which lurk an ambush just as many, uh, in ambush just as many bourgeois interests. Okay, so um, as the proletarian uh, laborer is reduced to wage slavery, uh, they become without property in any significant sense. Uh, even laborers who own their home, uh, we say that they own their home, they have a big mortgage that they're never gonna pay off. They don't really own their home. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's not the kind of property like the feudal lord used to enjoy. This is property to the extent that the laborer does get some property, it's all very precarious. It could all evaporate very quickly. Uh, a death in the family, if the laborer gets hurt themselves, uh, if they go to the hospital and have uh, uh, an unforeseen 
hospital expense, which is quite frequent nowadays, then they could just be totally wiped out overnight and it's all gone, it all evaporates. Uh, that's not genuine property. That's just the pretense of property. Uh, and and the same, you know, and and the bourgeois with their, you know, nice little families and, you know, a husband and a wife and two children, uh, as we've seen now more and more, we have more and more single mothers, uh, you know, alternative sort of family relation and that ideal of the husband and wife and two little children, it just is no longer with us because of the bourgeoisie themselves. They have the means to put on a show of that sort of thing. And, you know, we know how that goes too. It's not so idyllic, but it gives the appearances of a bourgeois family. Uh, but all the while, the vast majority of families are being torn apart by, by political economic um, destruction, by the, the precariousness of their existence and the need for everybody to be work, everybody in the family to be working and, and all that comes with that. And of course, law, morality, religion, this now all becomes kind of a joke. All the preceding classes that got the upper hand sought to fortify their already acquired status by subjecting society at large to their conditions of appropriation. The proletarians cannot become masters of the productive forces of society except by abolishing their own previous mode of appropriation and thereby also every other previous mode of appropriation. They have nothing of their own to secure and fortify. Their mission is to destroy all previous securities for and insurances of individual property. Okay, so, so since the proletarian worker laborer has no genuine property, they got nothing to lose. They're not trying to protect anything. What makes the proletarian revolutionary is that they got nothing to lose. And they want to destroy all previous property and all previous privileges. This is against privilege. Um, and again, this is not your favorite watch or your favorite shoes or your car or even your house if you happen to own a house. That's not what we're talking. We're talking about the kind of property that feudal lords enjoyed that the bourgeoisie enjoy. They own the factory. The big bourgeois millionaire, Sir Robert Peel, owns the factory, owns multiple factories, owns a country estate, owns the apartment that you live in as a worker. He owns everything and he's not gonna lose it quickly. Uh, the only way that that's gonna be taken from him and others like him is if the whole social relationships of the entire society is restructured. So this is a big project. Uh, and this is something that, that uh, many uh, Marxists and, and other socialists uh, have a big problem with, with uh, the communist manifesto and with communism in general is that uh, it's just too grandiose in the scope of its revolutionary pretensions. They want to change all of society. Why don't we start on something small? Why don't we start out just taking incremental steps? So there's a kind of incrementalism that argues against this. And uh, in the 21st century, more and more people uh, communist and Marxist are thinking more in incrementalist terms, uh, but that may just be a trend for a little while until, you know, revolutionary sort of circumstances start to arise again. When, when revolutionary potential seems uh, not very likely in the near future, Marxists and socialists tend to revert to a kind of incrementalism. And so at least they can keep something going. But when when things start heating up, like in the 1960s, where you had Vietnam, uh, you had 
the riots in Watts and Detroit and other places, and you had political upheaval like the Democratic National Convention in 1968. When all of this is happening, you have Martin Luther King Jr. being shot and, and uh, Robert Kennedy being shot in 1968 as well. Then Marxists and communists think, okay, the revolution is on, and, and, and then it's like grand strategy all over again. Uh, but in the more mellow times, it's like incrementalism, but, the, but uh, the Communist Manifesto was written in 1848, which was a time very ripe for revolution. Scheidler covers this uh, in the Mega Machine. Um, and, and so uh, I, I would encourage you to go back and look at the year 1940, or 1848 as, as, as Scheidler describes it, uh, because there was a, a continent-wide revolution in Europe in 1848, uh, just weeks after the Communist Manifesto was published. So, you know, they're talking in these very grandiose terms, but there was really the potential for the revolution to take place uh, very immediately. It almost happened in 1848, uh, a very big uprising of the proletariat. And it was a proletarian uh, type uh, revolution. All previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interest of minorities. The proletarian movement is the self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. The proletariat, the lowest stratum of our present society cannot stir, cannot raise itself up without the whole superincumbent strata of official society being sprung into the air. We gotta throw everything up, we gotta shuffle the deck because the proletarian uh, being the majority and, and working for, the, for the, the interest of the vast majority and not having any property uh, has to totally disrupt the order in order to make something happen. Okay. Though not in substance yet in form, the struggle of the proletariat with the bourgeoisie is at first a national struggle. The proletariat of each country must, of course, first of all, settle matters within its own bourgeoisie. In depicting the most general phases of development of the proletariat, we trace the more or less veiled civil war raging within existing society up to the point where that war breaks out into open revolution and where the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. Hitherto, every form of society has been based, as we have already seen, on the antagonism of oppressing and oppressed classes. But in order to oppress a class, certain conditions must be assured to it under which it can at least continue its slavish existence. The serf in the period of serfdom raised himself to membership in the commune, in the town just as the petty bourgeois under the yoke of feudal absolutism managed to develop into a bourgeois. And we saw that historical development. The modern laborer, on the contrary, instead of rising with the progress of industry, sinks deeper and deeper below the conditions of existence of his own class. So this is different. The, the proletarian is not even kept at subsistence level. The proletarian is pushed ever and ever lower. lower. He becomes a pauper. And pauperism develops more rapidly, rapidly than population and wealth. And here it becomes evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit any longer to, to be the ruling class in society and to impose its conditions of existence upon society as an overriding law. It is unfit to rule because it is incompetent to assure an existence to its slave within his slavery because it cannot keep help letting him sink into such a state that it has to feed him instead of being fed by him. Society can no longer live under this bourgeoisie. In other words, its existence is no longer compatible with society. So the bourgeoisie is forcing people into poverty and then ends up using the poor laws that we saw to feed who 
uh, can't eat by their labor. Uh, but the whole point was to suppress people down to this lower level so that you could employ them. But it doesn't employ them. It just starts creating masses and masses of unemployed uh, paupers, uh, poor people. There's a contradiction here. The bourgeoisie are not sustaining their own lifestyle. They're undermining their own lifestyle, their own form of society by not properly taking care of their slaves, uh, their wage slaves. Um, I was thinking there was something I wanted to say about Giselle and some of this. Uh, well, I don't know. I think there's something about Dussel there, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure what I was thinking. Okay, the essential condition for the existence and for the sway of the bourgeois class is the formation and augmentation of capital. Okay, that's what bourgeois capitalism is all about. Getting big piles of money and making those piles of money grow by the expropriation of labor as I've described in the schematic introduction to uh, Marxist political ecology. The condition for capital is wage labor. Capital needs wage labor in order for capitalism to function. Wage labor rests exclusively on competition between laborers. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces isolation of laborers due to competition by the revolutionary com combination due to association. The development of modern industry therefore cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces and appropriates products. What the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all is its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Okay. So again, uh, Marx and Engels were very prescient. prescient. 1848 was a Europe-wide revolutionary moment. Uh, it didn't come to full fruition. There was another uh, big uh, revolutionary moment, especially in France in 1871. Uh, and then of course, there came the revolution in Russia in 1917 uh, but it didn't really fit this model um, because largely in Russia, the revolutionary class were the peasants because there just wasn't that developed of a proletariat in Russia in 1917 because there just weren't that many big industrial capitalists. Uh, they were still living a quasi-feudal uh, existence. There really were serfs all the way up until 1917, like people who just lived as serfs and were not wage laborers. They were just people who lived on the land and gave a portion of their produce to their landlord and things like this. Uh, so the Russian Revolution, the most successful of the communist revolutions, uh, at least up until that point, and then we have the Chinese Revolution in, in 1949. 1936 to 49, um, maybe a little earlier than that, uh, but uh, it was, uh, you know, accomplished in 1949. Um, in both cases, in both Russia and in China, it were it were it was peasants that were mobilized uh, in the revolution, and uh, Mao in China did something very similar to Fidel and Che Guevara in in Cuba, um, organizing the 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 country peasants into an army. Uh, So the, the revolution never came. And so a question you might ask yourself if you're interested in this and you're gonna argue against this cell or, or maybe agree with him 
and doing an analysis of you know, the Communist Manifesto and who is the revolutionary class, is it the proletariat or is it the Puebla? Um, something to keep in mind is that although Marx and Engels were very prescient and it almost happened in 1848, it almost happened again in several moments, uh, even in, in uh, 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 1919 in, in Germany, um, it, never, it never really unfolds the way that they foresee. And so uh, what does that mean for Marxism? And does Marxist Leninism uh, help to readjust things? Uh, does the experience of, of Marxist revolutions in Latin America change things? Uh, you know, we got to do an analysis of the history, but uh, but as we stand in the 21st century now in 2021, most Marxists uh, are feeling very compelled to rethink Marxism, uh, in part because of the the lack uh, of the revolution in this intervening time period, but also because it seems like we're moving into a period that is going uh, beyond capitalism and. And so does the Marxist revolution really make sense uh, if we're not lo no longer living within capitalism? But that's, a, that's a up, up for debate, whether we are or we are not. Okay, so that is that first section uh, of the Communist Manifesto, and then I'll, I'll do something similar for the following sections here. Um, 